I mean by unseen, I don't mean that people don't see them at all. I mean that those who see act like they don't see. In other words, whether we pass them on the street or whether we pass them in some other capacity, uh, people look past other people, not, igno not acknowledging that they're there, not acknowledging their presence at all, and walking on by as if they did not exist at all. So that's what I mean by unseen. There used to be a time when people spoke to each other. Uh, when we were growing up, one of the things that was taught hard in our family, and I know not only mine, but many of you as well that come from the same generation and before, uh, you were taught, taught to speak to people when you pass them. And especially the younger people were expected to acknowledge the older people and give some respect. But we've come to a time in our history, a time in our society, a time in our culture where some folk will even look you straight in the face and still not speak. There are some who, if you, that, that I'll admit I've seen some, that you wonder whether or not you want to speak to them at all because they look like they're about ready to go off about something. But this is the times in which we live. There are those who are overlooked. And when I say overlooked, I mean we get so busy, we get so busy in our world and our society with all the hustle and the bustle. Well, we're not doing too much hustling and bustling right now, but with all the hustle and the bustle and our daily activities and things moving so quickly that we overlook those around us who may be in some sort of need, in some sort of capacity for which we can help. These people, for the most part, would be like somebody who has no name. In other words, to those who walk past, to those who don't speak, to those who give no acknowledgement whatsoever, uh, they, they, they basically don't exist. Name gives identification. That's the reason why our parents gave us names, uh, not only to fulfill the requirement of the law when it came to birth certificates and keeping records and keeping track of us when it came time for social security numbers and jobs and things like that. If you notice, if you get pulled over by a policeman, uh, one of the things that they're going to ask you for is for some form of identification, uh, that officer is looking for your name, uh, your address, and any other pertinent information that the officer might deem necessary. So names are given to help establish some identification, but it's also given for the purpose of giving some recognition. In other words, uh, I heard a psychologist say some years ago, and I don't remember the context of the discussion of what else was going on, but I remember someone, one of them making a comment that uh, when it came to, they were talking about, I take it back, they were talking about things for people who find themselves in some oppressive or criminal type situations. In other words, where someone maybe has attacked someone and holding them hostage uh, and things like that. And one of the things that this person said, and I've, and I've heard this since then in various places, that one of the things that they looked at, looked at that they say could be a possible tool to help bring this type of person who is the oppressor, who is the abductor, uh, around to some sort of common sense is to help them to recognize your name. 
and not only you, they recognize your name, but you also recognizing theirs. The idea that they put forth was this. It is that when the person who is the perpetrator, who they think has some sort of mental illness and things going on in the first place to do those type things, is brought to a recognition that the person that they are oppressing, the person they are abducting, the person that they are doing harm to, has a name, that name begins to register with them some sort of way, making them realize that this is another person I'm doing this to. This person has feelings. This person has thoughts. This person has a family. This person has others who care about them, who love them, and bring them around to some sense of consciousness uh, beyond the uh, mindset that they have. Now, just passing on to you some things that I've heard. Now, whether it's truth of this or not, I don't want any of us to ever have to be in a, that type of situation to find out. But the point of the matter is that from their perspective, name gives some recognition. When I've got that recognition, it says to everybody else, I'm here. <clears throat> it, says, it says to the person, I'm noticed or someone has noticed me because they know or have called my name. It means that I count in the bigger scheme of things that while I might not be but one little person, while I might not be but one little piece of the puzzle, nonetheless, I count because somebody recognized my name. Well, you don't give names to things that don't exist, uh, anything. So just the mere fact that your name is recognized and somebody acknowledges you gives that sense of recognition. And it make, makes no difference sometimes. Uh, it may, may not make any difference, or it doesn't make any difference, really, to tell the truth. Whether others may know you or not, the important thing is that you need to understand today, and I know that all of you connected with this do. Hopefully there's no one wrestling with this type of problem, but nonetheless, we all can gather some encouragement from it, that when it seems like nobody else around you is paying any attention. Nobody else around you seems to care. Nobody else around you seems to want to talk or to communicate. It's always good to know there is somebody who's, who, uh, whose eyes is on you. There is somebody else who knows your name. And that person that I'm talking about is our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ himself. The background of this scripture, basically speaking, uh, to kind of put it this way, is Jesus now is in a region, in an area. He's been calling and or starting to call and to put together the disciples that's going to follow him. And in this passage here in 1 John, and particularly down in this area, we see the humanity and the divinity of Jesus once again. In Bible study, we are studying through the book of Colossians and the Apostle Paul uh, takes great pains through the Holy Spirit with what he's writing to present to us who Jesus is, that he is the creator, that he is the son of God. All things are made by him. There's nothing made that was not made by him. He, John says he is the word because in the beginning was the word and the word was with God and the word is God. The word became flesh and dwelt among us. So, so we see that. But Jesus, while he is God, he is also a man, which means that when he was incarnate, and the word incarnate means in flesh. So when he came in flesh, then he identified with us. He was able to experience some of the things that you and I go through on a daily basis. He knows what it is to be tempted and tried by the devil. He knows what it is to be weak. He knows what it is to be hungry. He knows what it is to be rejected by those that are the, the, uh, of your own house, of your own family, of your own culture. He knows what it is to not have, to not be respected. He knows what it is to have people to call, call you to tell you that you are a devil when you're really just sincerely about God's business. He's able to identify with all of that because he came in human flesh, because he became incarnate. So he was both God and man. Well, here in this we see, uh, well, we will see <clears throat> rather some of the display of this once again, because when Philip discovers Jesus, he runs back to tell Nathaniel, Nathaniel that they have found uh, the Messiah, that they have found 
uh, him. But then when Philip tells Nathaniel where he is, where Jesus is, Nathaniel has a bit of a sarcastic question. Some say that Nathaniel was just kind of being uh, funny about it uh, and everything. I don't know. Uh, after having read it and studied some things myself, I don't know if Nathaniel was really trying to be front funny. Because, when, again, when you take a look at verse verse 46, the response that Nathaniel gives, he says, And Nathaniel said unto him, Can there any, can there any good thing come out of Nazareth? Philip didn't argue with, with Nathaniel at all. He just had three words. He said, Come and see. Well, why would Nathaniel make this kind of comment? Why would he say this kind of thing? Well, we've got to understand that just like there is prejudice now, there was prejudice then. Just like there was discrimination now, there was discrimination then. Only discrimination then didn't have to do with skin color. It had to do with what region you were from. The Jews didn't like the Samaritans, and there were even certain regions that didn't like each other for some reason, somehow, because Nathaniel thought that Nazareth or that area was insignificant, particularly that related to prophecy and things like that. So the question comes forward, can, is there any good thing, can anything good come out of Nazareth? So that kind of sets the background. So then when verse 47 comes and Jesus sees Nathaniel coming to him, look at what Jesus does. And when he makes this comment, this is the divine side of him that is speaking in verse 47. Jesus saw Nathanael come to him and said unto him, Behold, an Israelite in whom there is no guile. So the first point I want you to understand is, in answering the question, or to let you know that he knows your name, that he also knows all about you. In verse 47, Behold, an Israelite indeed in whom uh, is no guile. In other words, that word guile is taken from a word that means there's no deception, there's no deceit, there's no trickery. In other words, we can kind of uh, put that against the, the type of character that the Old Testament tells us about as it paints the picture for us and tells us the story of Jacob. Jacob was a trickster. His name means a trickster. And we know how he deceived his brother Esau. So Jesus now is just looking at Nathaniel coming to him and he says, Behold, an Israelite indeed in whom is no guile. Well, well when Jesus makes this comment, he's talking about the character of Nathaniel. Now, how could Jesus know this matter of Nathaniel's heart uh, supposedly, and to put it in human terms, never having seen him before, the only way that he can know about Nathaniel and about his heart and about his character and to declare upon him that here's a man that, that doesn't go around deceiving. Here's a man that, that's serious about business. Here's a man that when you give some information, he wants to investigate it. Here's one that cannot easily be uh, drawn aside. There's no tricking in him. There's no, there's no deception going on in him. The, listen, brothers and sisters, the only person who really, really, really knows us is God Almighty himself. The fact of the matter is, and I know that some of us even here, and I know there's a whole lot of people that don't like to hear this, but the fact of the matter is, is many times we don't even know ourselves. We always say, well, I'm not going to do this, and I'm not going to do that, and I'm not going to say this, and I'm not going to say that, when the fact of the matter is, is you don't know what you will do until you find yourself in that situation. But now Jesus makes this declaration concerning Nathaniel, behold, an Israelite indeed, in whom there is no guile. In other words, he knows all about us. He knows what kind of condition or situation we are in, and he knows that at all times. This, this same gospel writer, John, in chapter 11, read, writes to us and tells us the story of the man named Lazarus that Jesus went to the grave and spoke to in spite of the fact that Lazarus had been dead for days. Jesus already knew the condition of Lazarus. As a matter of fact, he intended for Lazarus to be dead that long in order that God, his Father, and he might be glorified. And when, when he steps outside the grave of Lazarus, he says, Lazarus, come forth. 
and you know the story. Lazarus comes forth, wrapped in his grave clothes, standing at the grave, uh, at the opening of the grave where they had placed him. He knows all there is to know about us. The Bible says that he knows the very number of the hairs on the top of our head. The psalmist writes and says he knows my down sitting and he knows my uprising. Uh, uprising. He knows my thoughts are far off. He knows where, I, where we're going even before we start. You don't know, you and I don't know what we're going to be doing an hour from now. We know what we might be liking to do. We might have plans to do certain things in an hour, but all of us know it doesn't take but a twinkling of an eye to turn our plans upside down. So you and I really don't know what's going to happen an hour from now, but I want to remind you this morning that we serve a God who knows all about us, and not only does he know what's going to happen to each and every one of us uh, in one hour, he, all, he knows where we're going to be. He knows who, who we're going to be talking to. He knows the words that we're going to be saying. He knows absolutely everything there is to know about us. When our heart is breaking, when our mind is confused, when it seems like that we're wrestling through the trials and tribulations of this world, and particularly in a spiritual battle, he understands and he knows our hurt and our pain. He hears the questions that we have that never really come off our lips but our, he knows when our hearts are full of questions about situations and circumstances of life, about relationships and all the other things that we don't seem to have answers to. He understands that because he knows all about us. He sees our frustrations and he sees our fears. And he's able to meet each and every one of them. All I've got to do is back you up to Mark, I believe it is, chapter 4, uh, somewhere along in there, where, Jesus, where the Bible paints a picture of us tells us the story of Jesus come walking to the disciples on the water. And, and they, when they first see Jesus coming to them, they supposed that he was some kind of a spirit. But then uh, Peter is the one who calls out to him and says, Lord, if that's, if that's you, then bid me to come unto you. And the Lord said, well, come on, Peter. Well, you know the story. When Peter leaped out of the boat, started to walk on toward Jesus, the winds was kicking up and the waves was beginning to uh, 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 what would we call rise and fall. In other words, the, 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 the sea was getting rougher and rougher. And Peter for a moment took his eyes off Jesus and he began to sink. When Peter began to sink, guess what? Peter had some fears. Peter had some frust frustrations. Peter was in a total anxious mode because Peter did not know what to do. But then when he called on the name of Jesus, the Bible says that the Lord reached down and caught him by his hand and lifted him up and they both went back to the boat together. As a matter of fact, as soon as Jesus lifted him up by, from, from the water, the, the, the scripture says they were immediately at the boat. So, so he understands our fears, he understands our frustrations, he understands the things that have us sinking in life that feels like there's no hope. When we can't make ends meet, he understands. In other words, the point I'm trying to make, brothers and sisters, is this. He knows absolutely everything there is to know about us. Take a look again at verse 47. Jesus said about Nathaniel, Behold, an Israelite indeed in whom there is no guile. Wouldn't you like to hear God say, I've looked at you and I've discovered that there's no deception in you. There's no trickery in you. That, that, that you're, you're serious about your business. You're serious about your commitment. You're serious about that. Wouldn't you like to be able to hear God's voice say that about you? Nathaniel heard the Lord say that about him. But even though Nathaniel at this point is not yet recognizing who Jesus is, Jesus is speaking truth about the character of Nathaniel, which brings us then to the second point. Because when you take a look at verse 38 and look at um, verse 48, rather, look at Nathaniel's response. <clears throat> Nathaniel said unto him, Whence knowest thou me? In other words, Nathaniel, to kind of put it another way, said, Where do you know me from? Uh, I've never seen you before in my life. Where, where do you know me from? Well, Jesus said, and answers and said unto him, Before that Philip called thee, when thou was under the fig tree, I saw thee. Before Philip went to get you, I saw you. As a matter of fact, 
if we really want to look at that before, since we're talking about Jesus speaking in this term from the position of being God, Jesus could carry that term on further. Before Philip even was, I saw you. Before you even existed, I saw you. Before there was anything created in heaven or in earth, I saw you. Why do you say that, Brother Pastor? Because remember, John says in Revelation, he says, I am Alpha and Omega, the beginning and the end. In other words, if he's at the beginning, which he was, if he created everything, which he did, if he's at the end and going to bring everything to a climax and he close, and he will, then there's no reason to be confused that he knows everything between the beginning and the end from the time that he had it set up. So even before he created everything, he knew Nathaniel. Well, let me just, let me just take this joy off Nathaniel and put it on you and me as well. Before he created anything, he knew you. He knew me. He knew the families that we would come from. He knew the families that we would, that we would uh, um, uh, be responsible for bringing into this world. He knew each and every one of us. He knew our character. He knew our disposition. He knew our mindset. He knew the service that we were going to bring to him. He knew, he, he knew those that were going to turn their back on him and never believe the gospel. He knew everything there was to know about him. So, he know, so point two, he knows your name. So when Nathaniel asked that question, where do you know me from? I haven't seen you before. Well, here the point is, you don't have to see him, but he sees you. you don't have to, a person doesn't have to know necessarily who Jesus is, but Jesus knows who they are. And if you want some quick examples of that, if you read in the book of Genesis chapter 6, you discover that there was a man named Noah. And the Bible says that Noah had found grace in God's, in God's eyes. But when God got ready, the Bible says that God approached Joah, uh, uh, Noah, that, that, that God called to Noah and let Noah know that, that the end of all flesh was in his sight. But he called Noah and called him by his name. When Moses was standing out there in the wilderness or on, on, on the mountain region and looking at a burning bush, and he got curious and went up on that mountain to investigate why this bush was on fire. But yet, even though this bush was not on, was on fire, it was not burning up. In Exodus chapter 3 is where we see this. But when he got close to where the bush was, God begins to call him by his name. Moses, Moses, take off your shoes because where you're standing is holy ground. In First Samuel chapter three, as, as Samuel as Hannah as Hannah had prayed and asked God to give her a child because she had been barren, and she promised the Lord. She said, "Lord, if you give me a man child, I'll give him back to you all the days of his life." And then she blessed her to conceive and bring forth a son and name him Samuel. And then when Samuel was old enough, she took him to the high priest Levi and turned him over to the service of Levi that Samuel could raise. Uh, could come up in the service of the Lord. One night, Samuel was there in the temple area, and he laid down, and he went to, and he was getting ready to go to sleep. When all of a sudden, he heard his name, Samuel, Samuel. Samuel got up out of his bed, ran into the other room where Eli was, and says, "I'm here. What do you need?" Eli looks at him and says, "I didn't call you. Go on back and lay down again." Samuel runs back to his bed and lays down again. It's right there in First Samuel chapter three. You can read it for yourself. Samuel goes back and lays down again, and Samuel hears his voice again. Samuel, Samuel, Samuel gets up and runs back into Eli. Eli and says, and Samuel says, "You called me." Eli said, "Samuel, I didn't call you. Go on back and lay down again." Well, when Samuel when Samuel went back the third time and lay down. Here come God calling him by his name again. I told you that he knows your name. He said, Samuel, Samuel. Samuel gets up this time and runs to Eli, and it seems like, at least for the way the scripture reads, it looks like Samuel at this point was ready to argue with Eli. He says, look, I heard you call me. What is it that you want? But all of a sudden, God helped Eli to understand what was going on. And Eli said, Samuel, go on back and lay down. And if you hear your name called again, just say, speak, Lord, your servant here. Well, Samuel runs on back into his room, lays down on his bed, and sure enough, 
here comes the Lord calling his name again, Samuel, Samuel. And the scripture says that Samuel did exactly what Eli told him to do, said, speak, Lord, your servant hears. And you go ahead and read uh, 1 Samuel chapter 3, and you discover what it is that the Lord says to Samuel. But I've told you that little part of the story to let you know that God knows your name. You remember in Matthew records it, I believe. I'm not quite sure whether Mark or the other gospel writers do. Uh, records and tells us a story about a man who was short in stature. He was a tax collector. The people hated him. But one day he heard that Jesus was passing by, and because he was so short in stature, he couldn't see past the people. So the scripture says that he ran down the road a little bit and climbed up in a tree to sit there on the limb to watch Jesus so he could see Jesus when Jesus came passing him by. Well, when Jesus got to the spot, look what the scripture says that Jesus did. Jesus looked up at him and didn't say, young man, come down out of the tree. He didn't say, uh, 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 you Israelite, come on down out of the tree. No, he called him by his name. And Zacchaeus had never seen Jesus to speak to him before. He said, Zacchaeus, come down. He said, because I must abide at your house tonight. In other words, church, I just want you to understand he knows your name. And while I'm making this individual, as it relates to individual people, to kind of paint a picture for us that no matter what you're going through right now, and we know that we're all going through some challenges, we're all going through some ups and downs, we're all going through some things that's uncomfortable, Jesus knows what we're going through. He knows where we are. He knows what we are experiencing. He knows all about us. Heaven's attention is on you. Heaven's attention is on me. And as long as we know that if nobody else pays attention, Jesus is paying attention, that ought to give us the strength then to move on. But he doesn't just identify people individually by names. He does it for churches as well. Because in Revelations chapter 2 and 3, we discover that, that Jesus called his John to write seven letters to seven churches. And they didn't just say, John, write seven letters and send them out to wherever you can find a church or something like that and let people read them. No, he called the church by its name. In other words, it was identified for a specific church at a specific time, going through a specific thing, even though that church represented the character and disposition of many churches down through the church age until God brings things to a close. Every one of those seven letters had a particular church name on it. Progressive Missionary Baptist Church, Jesus knows who you are. And he's, his focus is upon us. His, his hand has been upon us for over a 100 years. His hand will continue to be upon us until he decides that he's finished for the work that he has set before our hand. Our hand. He knows our name. Point number three, he knows where you are at all times. Verse 49 and 50, it says, Nathaniel answered and said unto him, Rabbi, thou art the Son of God, thou art the King of Israel. In verse 50, he says, Jesus answered and said unto him, Because I said I, because I said unto you, I saw thee under the fig tree, believest thou, thou shalt see greater things than these. In other words, he knows where you are, he knows where we are at all times. Jesus didn't just say, Nathaniel, I know you. He told Nathaniel where he saw him. What's the significance of him pointing out that Nathaniel was under the fig tree? We don't know. Maybe Nathaniel, Nathaniel went there to meditate. Maybe that's where Nathaniel went to, to think about some things that he had heard as it relates to the word of God. Maybe that's where Nathaniel went to just kind of give himself some relaxation or something we don't know. But Jesus points out specifically where he saw Nathaniel so that when he made that comment, he was revealing something to Nathaniel that only Nathaniel knew. Philip didn't know that. Peter didn't know that. Or none of the other disciples that would come along knew that about Nathaniel. Only Nathaniel knew himself. So when the Lord speaks those things, that's the reason why even in the previous verse, 
Nathaniel turns around and recognizes him. Rabbi, thou art the son of God. No longer is his mind talking about, can anything good come out of Nazareth? No, he recognizes something mighty that's come out of Nazareth now. Rabbi, thou art the son of God. Thou art the king of Israel. So, so he, helps, he helps Nathaniel to understand that no matter where you are, he sees us at all times. Sometimes when people think that they're getting away with stuff that nobody else can see, I want to remind you, and you can remind them, that Jesus sees at all times. I shared this story a few times. I'll share it again this morning. I can remember a time where, you know, going to visit people some years ago. You know how pastors would sometimes just drop by and visit families and things like this, knock on the door, and somebody peeks out the door and made the comment, oh, my gosh, it's the pastor, and all kind of rumblings and bang, banging around, going on on the inside and things like that, trying to straighten things up, trying to hide things because they don't want the pastor to see. Pastor's standing outside the door. Pastor can't see what we're doing in here. But what they needed to know was is that they didn't need to worry about the pastor. The one they needed to be concerned about was there and was there all the time because he sees everything we do. He hears everything we say. He sees every motive, every, every, every intent of the heart. He's there all the time. So he knows where we are at all times. He knows where we are in our walk with him. He knows where we are in our relationship with him. He knows where we are in our commitment to him. He knows all of these things, brothers and sisters, about us. He knows our name. But he also knows his purpose for you. In other words, he has a purpose for every one of us. Take a look very quickly at verse 51. He says, and he said unto him, Verily, verily, I say unto you, Hereafter ye shall see heaven open, and the angel of God ascending and descending upon the Son of Man. In other words, Jesus is now calling Nathaniel to become one of his disciples, and, and he's telling Nathaniel, Nathaniel, if you are amazed, if you are standing in awe, if you are taken the, the fear of fact that I told you, that I saw you sitting under the fig tree even before Philip went back to get you, if that got your attention, I want to let you know something. You haven't seen anything yet. But verily I say unto you that hereafter you shall, uh, you shall see heaven open and the angels of God ascending and descending upon the Son of Man. Um, um, so he knows his purpose for us. Jeremiah uh, can testify to this because in Jeremiah chapter 1 verse 5 when Jeremiah was concerned about doing what the Lord wanted him to do here's, here's what the Lord said to Jeremiah in Jeremiah chapter 1 verse 5 before I formed thee in the belly I knew thee and before thou camest out from the womb I sanctified thee and ordained thee a prophet unto the nation in other words before you were even conceived in your mama's womb, even before you were conceived, I knew you, I ordained you, and I set you to be a prophet for me to the nation. Before you were even conceived, he knows his purpose for each and every one of us. Every one of us that names the name of Jesus, every one of us has been born again, washed in the blood, the Holy Spirit dwelling on the inside of us. He has a purpose for each and every one of us. The Apostle Paul lists for us the spiritual gifts in 1 Corinthians chapter 12, in Ephesians chapter 4, in Romans chapter 12 as well. Paul lists the various gifts of the Spirit and talents that are provided because every person that names the name of Christ and is born again quickened by the Holy Spirit, the Holy Spirit gives a particular spiritual gift to, to be used for the advancement of God's kingdom, to be used to glorify his name, to be used to help um, uh, to be a vessel that the Lord can use in the work of his kingdom. He has a purpose for you. And not only does he know your name, and not only does he know where you are, and not only does he know the condition you are in, he has a purpose for your life. Some people, and yes, even some believers, just sit around day after day, the sun rises in the east, goes down in the west, watch the sun rise in the east, go down in the west, and it's what it seems like their life has no purpose, it seems like it has no direction, but if you have been born again, 
Jesus has a purpose for your life. There's no such thing as him saving a person for the person to sit down. There's no such thing as a pew member. There's no such thing as just joining the church, and I'm just joining it to come to church on Sunday morning so I can hear the choir sing, maybe listen to the pastor preach or something. There's no such thing as a person saved that has that particular function. That's what, pe- that's what church people do. That's what people who go to church do, but that's not what saints do. That's not what the saved do. The saved go to worship. The saved have a purpose. The saved have a ministry. The saved has a mission. It has a co-mission. And it's to advance the kingdom of God, to spread the gospel of Jesus Christ, to develop our talents and gifts to the glory of his name so that when people see us working, and when people see us loving each other, they say, oh, see how they love each other. I want to be like them. How can she walk around and always have a smile on her face when I, when I know that there's some troubles and things that she's going through? How can she have that smile? Peter's the one who steps up and say, be ready at all times to give a reason for the hope that is within you. You can't give somebody the reason for the hope within you if you ain't got no hope. And if you've got Jesus, you ought to have hope and have it all the time. So he knows his purpose for you. He knows a journey that he has set you on and ready to start you to go in. All these things he has set in motion because he knows your name. He knows who you are. So he says to Nathaniel, he says, Nathaniel, you haven't seen anything yet. And when Jesus spoke these words, and I'm just about done, when Jesus spoke these words, I realized that we can take this right here and we can say, well, uh, he's talking about Nathaniel's going to see him raise a dead. Nathaniel's going to see him feed the 5,000. Nathaniel's going to see him walk on the water. Nathaniel's going to see him turn water to wine and, and all these other various things. And that very well may be true. That may be all that may be what the Lord was referring to when he spoke these words to Nathaniel. But I think, I believe that it goes further than that. In other words, if you, if you are in awe about this, if you are amazed about, about that, if you're amazed because I told you I saw you before, then you haven't seen anything yet. In other words, he knows the love that he has for us. You haven't seen anything yet. In other words, if you, if you are in awe about what I said concerning you, hang around for a while because one of these days you're going to see me lifted up high and stretched wide. One of these days, you're going to see me hang my head in the locks of my shoulder, die and give up the ghost. One of these days, soon and very soon, you're going to see them take me down off that cross, and you're going to see them put me in a tomb. One of these days, very shortly, you're going to see me, three days later, rise from the grave. If you think that you've been all in what I just said, Nathaniel, i got something to tell you. You haven't seen anything yet. And what I want to remind us is that the Lord is saying the same thing to us. We haven't seen anything yet. It's the, one of the, I think it's Paul who writes, who says, Eye has not seen, ear has not heard, neither has it entered into the heart of man the good things that God has prepared for them that love him. John writes in Revelations where God says, Behold, I make all things new, and God shall wipe away all tears from their eyes. There's not going to be any more suffering. There's not going to be any more pain. There's not going to be any more confusion. There's not going to be any more this political jargon going back and forth. There isn't going to be any more disease. There isn't going to be any more cancer. Have you ever stopped to think about sometimes the businesses that are going to be put out of business when Jesus sets up his kingdom once and for all? There won't be any doctors because nobody's going to get sick. Nobody's going to be running to the drugstore to get vitamins and oil of Olay because nobody's going to have to worry about getting old. Nobody's going to have to run to the funeral home because nobody's going to die. Nobody's going to take arthritis medicine because nobody's going to be hurting with aches and pains. Nobody's going to be having to worry about this and worry about that. Nobody's going to have to worry about slick uh, slick salesman because nobody's going to be selling anything. There's going to be a whole lot of earthly business that's not going to exist on the other side. So what Jesus said, if, if, you think, if you think you can get a little bit joyous about this, if you think you can get a bit joyous about that, you haven't seen anything yet. Wait until you see the streets of gold. Wait until you see the pearly gates. Wait until you see the place that I have prepared for you because that's the last point I'm going to give you. He has, he has a place For you, he knows your name, and he has a place for you. John says in John 14, 1, he says, God, Jesus says, 
uh, let not your heart be troubled. You believe in God, believe also in me. In my Father's house are many mansions. If it were, if it were not so, I would have told you. I'm going to prepare a place for you. And if I go and prepare a place for you, I'm going to come again and receive you unto myself. That where I am, there you may be also. I have a place for you. I don't just know your name. I don't, I don't just know what you're going through. I don't just know your character. I don't just know your ups and downs. I don't just know your gifts and talents. I don't just know this and that about you, but I've got a place for you, and I'm going to come again and receive you unto myself. Therefore, my brothers and sisters, because he knows us and we know him, do you know what you and I can do? You and I can move on. You and I can march on. You and I can serve on. You and I can sing on. You and I can press on. You and I can pray on. You and I can trust on. You and I can testify on. Sometimes we might get a little uh, weary. Sometimes we might get slowed down, but we'll never get stopped. We might get delayed, but we'll never get defeated. We might stumble, but we will never utterly fall because he knows our name. He knows who we are. We, he knows that we belong to him. And he said a long time ago, that the gates of hell shall not prevail against his church. And when he said church, he's not talking about a building set in the 20, 2945 bells. He's not, set it, he's not talking about some other building, some other place or some other address with a great big steeple on top of it. No, he's talking about the people that congregate there who have been washed in the blood of the Lamb. That is the church. The Apostle Paul says in 1 Corinthians chapter 8, verses 22 to 20, uh, verses 2 through 3, he says, and if any man think that he hath, think that he knoweth anything, he knoweth nothing as he ought to know. But if any man love God, the same is known of him. If any man love God, the same is known of him. Do you love Jesus? Do, 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 when I say love Jesus, I mean, I mean, do we really love him? Do we know what it is to love him? He said, if you love me, Keep my commandments. Paul says, but if any man love God, the same is known of him. He goes on to say in that same book, 1 Corinthians chapter 13, verse 12, he says, For now we see through a glass darkly, but then face to face. Now I know in part. But look what he says. But then shall I know even also as I am known. In other words, while I'm walking through this maze of life, while I'm walking through the crooked paths, while I'm walking through times when it's dark and times when it's light, while there's a lot of questions in my mind, while there's a lot of things I don't understand, there's going to come a time when I will know even as I am known. I'm going to see him face to face. We're going to glorify his name. We're going to be in his presence forever. I'm going to be, I'm going to know even also as I am known. He knows all about me, and for whatever capacity he allows us, when we have these glorified bodies to be in his presence, we're going to know him in a way that we have never known him before. John writes in, a, in one of his epistles, I think it's either First uh, John or Second John, John writes and says this. He says, Beloved, he says, It does not yet appear what we shall be, but when he appears, we shall be like him. When he appears, we shall be like him. At the beginning of this, it can be put as a question. Lord, do you know me? But when it's all said and done, when we get down here to the end, it ought to be an exclamation point. Lord, you know me. Thank God, thank God for Jesus that yes, he knows us. Because while he was hanging there on Calvary, he had your name in his mind. When he was shedding his blood on Calvary, he had your name on his heart. When he was shedding and going through the agony of the suffering of the cross and being crucified, he knew your name. When he rose from the grave early Sunday morning, three days later, with all power and heaven and earth in his, in his hand, 
He knew your name. Because when he rose from that grave, he says, now, not only have I paid for Brother Snorgrass's sin, but now I've, I've satisfied the Father and Brother Snorgrass can be justified. And not just me, but everyone if you listen to me and everyone that, that believes the gospel of Jesus Christ, now they can be justified. Now you can be, not only do I know your name, but now you can be eternally declared to be free and forgiven from your sin if you're willing to place your faith in me. So you might begin with a question, Lord, do you know me? Or do I know you? Where do I know you from? But if we know him now, we ought to be able to turn that question mark into an exclamation statement. It says, Lord, you know me, and thank God you allowed me to know you. Father in heaven, as we come to the end of this message this morning, we thank you for the time that you have provided, and we thank you for the message at hand. We thank you for encouraging our hearts, Lord, that sometimes we feel alone, sometimes we feel isolated, sometimes even confused, and it seems like nobody else cares. But when we recognize that you know our name, when we recognize that you, when you pay that price, that you, that you were doing it because you knew our name, you paid that price and then gave us a place where we could be in your presence forever. We thank you, Lord, this day with all of our heart, soul, mind, and strength. The scripture lets us know this. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. We're extending an invitation to Christian discipleship right now. And, re and what we're doing is I realize that we can't see each other. Uh, well, we, if we had the cameras on, we could. But we can't see each other like we were, like we could if we were assembled at church. And so in a setting like this, there's no place for you to come down the aisle and say, well, I want to give my heart to Jesus. There's no place our people, so to speak, for you to stand before um, in that same way. But God has given us this mode of operation so that even in a time like this, if there's one listening to me then that does not know Jesus in the pardon of their sin, you can still receive that gospel message. You can still be saved right where you are. Because the scripture says, the day, and the writer of Hebrews says, the day that you hear my voice, harden not your heart. Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If any man will open up, he said, I will come in and sup with him and he with me. Paul says, if you're willing to confess with your mouth, Lord Jesus, and believe in your heart that God has raised him from the dead, then you shall be saved. This opportunity is for you.